faith in the prohibition of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam is in making an effort to be a person who's not being fair and just between your children. This is something that is a problem. The ayat also shows that the children of the Anbiya, they are not immune from falling into mistakes. The ayat ended by saying, "Inna shaitan lil insani adumun mubin." The shaitan is a clear enemy to mankind. And mankind is general. The prophets and the messengers are divinely protected by Allah Azza wa Jal. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. As for their children. Their children can fall into kufr. Their children can fall into dhulm. Their children can fall into all kinds of issues. In the case of Yusuf, some of them plotted and planned to even kill him. When they started to discuss the issue, some of them said, Uqtulu Yusuf, kill him. And one of them, who his opinion prevailed, he said, don't kill him. Let's just throw him away. So the point here is, the point here is, that the sons, the daughters, the children of the NBA, they're not always guaranteed to be religious people. And that's another consistent paradigm throughout the Quran. The Quran has given us every representation of every family, the religious wife, the irreligious husband. The religious husband, the irreligious wife, the sons and the children who are good, the mother and the father were bad. The mother was bad, the father was bad, and the child is good. All of those examples have been given to us in the Quran, proving that point. That al hidayah and being guided is with Allah Azawajal, and the religious person is not guaranteed that his child is going to be religious. So if that happened with the prophets and the messengers, those of us who are practicing and some of our children go astray. You have in an example, nice examples, good examples, with the prophets and the messengers who went before us. If Allah didn't guide their children, then don't become angry and upset with Allah with the qadr that your child was not guided. Your relative was not guided. It's one of the benefits of the ayat. We go on, ikhwani, to the next ayat at hand. Extremely important ayat that deals with a lot of the shubahat, the enemies of Islam, they tried to bring to the table. And that's the statement of Allah Ta'ala telling about his ni'mah upon Yusuf. He said in the Quran in this particular surah, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ تَأْوِيلَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلَ الْأَحَدِيثِ وَيُتَمُّ نِعْمَتُهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِن قَبَلْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْحَاقُ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah said to Yusuf after this issue of the dream that he had and what his father told him, Allah informed him and revealed to him, although he was young. He said, this is the ijtiba of Allah. This is how Allah has divinely chosen you, Yusuf. He chose to teach you the interpretation of dreams. Not all of the interpretations of dreams. You alimuka min ta'wil al-ahadith. That he will teach you some of the interpretation. So during that time, Yusuf was the best human being as it relates to interpreting dreams. Better than his father, better than everybody else. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And although that was the case, Allah Ta'ala identified in this ayat that Yusuf knew some of the interpretations. So we as Muslims, ikhwani, we have to learn and we have to get a minhaj as it relates to dreams and interpreting dreams. There are some books that have been attributed to some of the great scholars of Al-Islam, like Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri. There is a book that is Mansub Ilayhi, said that he wrote the book. It's the first book written in this issue called The Interpretations of Dreams. So they say if you see milk, it means this. If you see a cow, it means that. If you see blood, it means that. If you see a child with teeth, it means that. If you see Mecca, it means this. And on and on and on. So the Muslim who doesn't have a minhaj, he'll get that book, and he'll just believe everything in the dream that was mentioned that he saw in his dream. That book is not even clear if it's really from Al-Hasan al-Basri. Not even clear. Some of the scholars try to do this, but they will always say, these are just some of the ijtihadats and efforts of the ulama. You can't say for sure. So as it relates to this, if Yusuf didn't know all of the interpretations of dreams, no one does. So if a person has the ability, he knows someone, who can interpret some dreams. You can't believe and you can't think that there's a person you can call up every dream you have, you put it to him, and whatever he tells you, that is the truth. Can't be like that. No doubt, dreams that are good, they are possibly examples 
trying to tell you something. But again, they are not revelation. They don't make new ahkam in al-Islam. They do what the ulama of al-Islam call, they do al-istiknaf. Al-istiknaf, where the individual, he uses it as an example, as a possibility. But not something that is going to cause him harm or something that's definitely going to cause him some benefit. So Allah Ta'ala informed Yusuf that he chose him divinely by giving him the interpretation of some of the dreams and that Allah wanted to complete his ni'mah upon Yusuf just as he completed the ni'mah upon the family of Yaqub, the family of Yusuf, the father of Yusuf, Yaqub. What's the ni'mah on Yaqub? The ni'mah on Yaqub is that all of those sons who conspired against Yusuf in the beginning of this particular story all of them made toba, and later on they became prophets and Allah Azza wa revealed to them just as he revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and just as he revealed to the other prophets before them and after them Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in So Allah, he made his ni'mah upon the family of Yaqub as he made, as he said in this ayat and he said to Yusuf and the way we revealed to your father Ibrahim and Ishaq the father of Yusuf is Yaqub. But Allah Azza wa said that he made the ni'mah upon the father of Yusuf, Ibrahim and Ishaq. Ibrahim is not the direct father of Yusuf. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam brought a religion like this ayat of the Quran that shows a man can be called the name of his father and is not considered to be anything wrong with that. Some of the non-Muslims, they come to the Quran and they look at these types of ayat in which Allah Azza wa called Ibrahim's father or ya, uh, called Yusuf's father Ibrahim and Ishaq. And that's not the case. Ishaq is the uncle of Yusuf. And Ibrahim is the grandfather of Yusuf. So they say, look, 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 look at the contradiction of the Quran and the story of Maryam. Allah Ta'ala said that the people from Bani Israel, they said to Maryam, Ya Ukhta Harun, a hey, sister of Harun. Your father wasn't a bad person, and your mother, she wasn't a lowly person. So they say, Look, well, how is Harun the sister of the brother of Maryam? Harun was with Musa, and Maryam came way after Musa, and they take these examples, and there are many in the Quran, not knowing. Uh, what Al-Islam is saying and what the scholar of Islam said in explaining those issues. As it relates to Allah Azza wa calling Ibrahim and Ishaq, the father of Yusuf, it's a proof in Al-Islam that a man could be called the son of his grandfather, a man could be called in Al-Islam even the son of his uncle, that's permissible. Before the Nabi of Islam became a Nabi and a Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Kuffar of Quraysh used to call him Muhammad ibn Abdul Muttalib. So on the day of Uhud, when the news spread that the Prophet was killed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the companions were getting nervous as a result of that because they didn't know what happened to him because all of the skirmishes were going on, he called himself Muhammad ibn Abdul Muttalib. He said, I'm Muhammad ibn Abdul Muttalib. I'm here, I didn't get killed. So in the culture of the Arabs in which the Quran was revealed, a man could be called by the name or by the tasmiyah of his grandfather and there's no problem with that. And there are some ahkam that come about as a result of that, but we're not going to get into that particular issue. This ayat, rabbuka, is an important ayat. First of all, it shows that an-nabuwa, it doesn't come as a result of inheritance, and prophecy doesn't come as a result of people making themselves prophets. With the Christians right now, they see themselves as being prophets. They're ministers, all of them, they're preachers, the women from amongst them, anyone who has a large flock, a large gathering, anyone who's powerful, they can just say, I'm a prophet. They have the right to interpret the Bible in the way that they want to interpret it. And as a result of the interpretations, people believe them because they think that they're real prophets. A nabu, a prophecy, is not like that. It's not discharged amongst the people like that. A nabu comes from divine choosing by Allah. The divine choosing. Like he used in this word. Like Prophet Muhammad, his name is Al-Mujtaba. Allah, he divinely chose him. 
al Mukhtar, al Mustafa. Allah divinely chose him from Baina between everyone else. For this reason, there's a great scholar in Islam. He's a scholar of al Hadith and one of the greatest ulama of al Hadith, al Imam Ibn Hibban. That's one of the main books of al Hadith, the Sahih of al Imam Ibn Hibban. When he was asked about al Nabuwa, he said something that he was criticized for. Something that has been attributed to him. Allah knows best. Hard to tell. Did he say it? Did he not say it? Some people said he did. Some people said he did. He described and he defined a nabuwa as knowledge and actions. When he was asked, what is a nabuwa in Islam? He said it's knowledge and his actions. The scholars doing his time. It is said, when he gave that definition, they made tabdi of him and said he was a mubtadi. They avoided him and made hajar of him. He's from the Ulama of the Sunnah and he's from the good people. It is said that he said that. Allah Alam. Some people said, yeah, until today. Some people say, we don't think that this Imam will say such a thing. But even if he did say such a thing, any time a Muslim finds that his Muslim brother or sister says something that you can make a possible interpretation for it and it's not the worst one, then that's what we should do. And we shouldn't be like the people who give the worst possible interpretation for something that a Muslim says. If you can find a way out for him, then find a way out for him, especially if you know he's a person of the Sunnah. He's a person who has ijtihad. He's a person who knows what he's doing. He's trying to do the right thing. Everybody's going to make a mistake for that reason. And the Imam al Dhahabi, when he wrote about the history of Ali Imam Ibn Hiban, he brought this issue. To this very day, people say about Al Imam Ibn Hiban that he said a statement of kufr. That a nabuwa prophecy is knowledge and actions. And Imam al Dhahabi said, I don't think that this particular Imam would say something like that. But if he did, then this is a word and a statement that a Muslim may say it and a non Muslim may say it. The people of philosophy who said that a nabuwa is knowledge, for an example, he said they say it, but they mean one thing. They don't want to submit themselves to. And Nabuwa. So they interpret and Nabuwa as something that's light and easy. You have knowledge, I have knowledge, he has knowledge, I don't have to listen to any of you. He said, well, if the Muslim were to say that, and he shouldn't say it, but if the Muslim were to say it, like in the case of Al Imam Ibn Iban, if he really said that, then what did he mean? He meant that and Nabuwa is knowledge, meaning the prophets brought knowledge. The ulama are the inheritors of the NBA because of the knowledge. And and Nabuwa is actions. The scholars, those people who were the NBA, they came with actions, obviously. So you're going to give them a good interpretation. Whatever the case is, whatever the case is, and Nabuwa comes as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely choosing people. But I would like for those of you who are interested in examples where people of the Sunnah had problems between themselves because this issue is old, it's not something that's new. Go and look at this situation between. Al Imam ibn Hiban and the ulama of al Hadith during his time concerning this statement of his concerning Al Nabuwa, what is it and what it is not. In this case, in this case, we say that if he did say that Al Nabuwa is knowledge and it is actions, then it's similar to the Hadith of the Prophet when he talked about Hajj. He said that Al Hajj is Arafah. Linguistically, he said in Adif, Al-Hajj is Arafah. He didn't mean that all of Hajj is just Arafah. Just like Al-Imam ibn Hibban didn't mean all of Nabuwa is knowledge. All of Nabuwa is actions. He didn't mean only that. That includes Nabuwa. He said, Dua hu al-ibadah. Making Dua is in and of itself worship. It's Ibadah. It's not the only Ibadah, but it's part of Al-Ibadah. So this issue is one of those issues that always comes up as it relates to the tafsir of Surah to Ad Yusuf. Surah Yusuf. The next ayat, Ikhwani, another tremendously beneficial and important ayat is the statement of Allah Ta'ala, إِذْ قَالُوا لَيُوسُفُ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِينَ مِنَّا وَنَحْنُ أُسْبَةٌ إِنَّا أَبَانَا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ The brothers of Yusuf said, Verily Yusuf and his brother, they are more beloved to our father than we are. And we are an Uspa. We are a gang of people. We are a group of people. We're more than three people. 
they're only two and we're more than them. We're actually stronger than them and we're more than them. If anything, we're going to benefit our father more than these two. They're younger than us. We're more than them. We know more than them. They said, verily, our father is in Dalal. Our father is a strain. First thing that we want to mention about this particular ayat, Ikhwani, is that as it relates to the issue of Dalal, what does it mean in this case? Is it permissible for the sons of Yaqub to describe him as being in Dalal, like Dalim, to be astray? Because some of the people who take parts of the religion and leave other parts, they rejected the possibility of Yusuf, of Yaqub's sons becoming prophets and messengers because to describe Yaqub as being in Dalal is kufr, and that's true. But the Dalal in the Quran has multiple meanings. Being astray, this word Dalal in the Quran, it doesn't just mean Dalim being astray like that in the negative sense. It has a number of meanings in the Quran, actually three of them. One meaning of Dalal in the Quran is for a person to supposed to be on the religion, but he's doing things. He's on the deen, he has a religion, but he's doing things that are sacrilegious. He's doing things that are outside the bounds. So that person is dalal, like the Yahud and the Nasara. That's why we mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha, don't make us of those people who are dalim, because they're supposed to have a religion, and they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So if a person is in the deen of Islam, and he's saying and doing tricks and magic, and he's doing crazy things, that's dalal. That's Dalala, because it's something he's doing in the name of the religion. Claiming and believing it's from the religion. And that could take a person outside of Al-Islam. That's one meaning from many ayat of the Quran. Another meaning of Dalal is something that is buried. Something that disappears. Like the Kufa of Quraysh, when they used to say to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَقَالُوا أَإِذَا دَلَلْنَا فِي الْأَرْضِ they used to say to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when we become dalal in the earth meaning we die and we're put in the earth dalal means to be buried the Arabs use that word to say something that is buried is dalal so it's just not the dalal where you're astray on the religion and again goes to show the importance and the richness of the Arabic language which Dalal did those sons mean when they described their father, the Nabi, that he was astray? Well, which one did they mean? Did they mean the one that he was Dalal in the religion? No, they didn't mean that. Did they mean that he was buried? They didn't mean that. They meant the third Dalal in the Quran. And that is the one who his decision about something is without knowledge. He doesn't have correct knowledge or complete knowledge about something. Like Allah Azzawajal described the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam when he said about him, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالٍ فَهَدَى Allah found you Muhammad Dalin. You were astray. And then Allah guided you. But what was the dalal that the Prophet was on? Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam. Was it like the dalal of the Yahud and the Nasara in the religion? It wasn't like that. He didn't have a religion as such. It was like the rest of the people of Quraysh in that he didn't have any religion per se. He was still on the Tawheed of Ibrahim and Ismail, but he wasn't guided by the Quran or book. So he didn't have knowledge about the reality of Al Islam. So it should be known that that's the meaning and that's the interpretation and that's the intent of the sons of Yaqub. That their father didn't give the right ruling, didn't feel correctly his feelings of raising up Yusuf and his brother over them, this isn't the correct position. This isn't the correct ruling. That's the meaning of the Dalal in that particular ayat. After that, Ikhwani, concerning the ayat, it's a clear indication that people, they are many times tricked by the many numbers that they may have or that others may have. Those brothers, they said, we're better than Yusuf because we're more in numbers. Another consistent story of the Quran. Don't look at it and don't pay attention to the numbers. Allah does not put emphasis on issues like that. What's important is the
the quality and not so much the quantity and how many. Allah Ta'ala's companions or the prophets, his companions, on the day of Hunayn and the battle of Hunayn, they thought that they were in a good position simply because they had more people than they ever had at any of the wars that they fought. But when they actually engaged in Muslims in the battle, their numbers didn't help them at all. So being fooled by numbers, again, is a consistent message throughout the Quran. Kufar of Quraysh, they did that a number of times in the Quran, a number of ayat were revealed, telling the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of their plots and their plans and the fact that they felt that they were in a better position because they had more people. They wanted to kill the Prophet and stop his da'wah and his message because of their numbers. But Allah Ta'ala revealed in all of those ayats that the numbers, they're not what necessarily helps the truth or stops the truth or other than that. Lastly, concerning the ayat, this word usba that they use, the word asabiyah comes from it. They said that our father, he loves Yusuf and his brother more than us, and we are an usba, we are a group of people. The word asabiyah, to be fanatical. You know the guy who's on the madhab, when he's with a jama'ah, and he's fanatical on his madhab, or he's fanatical with his jama'ah. This word comes from that, an asabiya, usba. And this word is mentioned in the Quran in four different times. It's mentioned. And each time that it's mentioned, usba, each time that it's mentioned, it's mentioned being criticized, and it's mentioned in the way of evil, each time. Two times it's been mentioned in Surah Yusuf. This is one of them. The second time is in Surah An-Nur, An-Nur, concerning the people who made the story of the ifk, or the story of the slander against Aisha. Allah Ta'ala to mention, in al-lazina ja'u bil-ifk usbatun mink, minkum. Those people who came with the story, they are a band of people from amongst you, Muslims, meaning most of them are munafiqeen, and some of the companions who made the mistake so that's the third place where the word is being used and it's a negative situation talking about for the most part those munafiqeen who has something to say the first ayat and the fourth and the last ayat is mentioning is in surah al-qasas concerning Qarun Qarun was that individual with, with Fir'aun who had a great treasure and his treasure was so big that an usba, usba ur al quwa, that only a band of strong people can carry the treasures. Again, the word is being used for personality who is a problem, personality of evil. So the fact that it was used two times in the story of Yusuf goes to show again this, this issue and this benefit of al asabi is a problem. It's going to always create hasad, it's going to always create people plotting and planning against other people is going to always create a ta'amur against people. You come together, those people come together in order to harm people they perceive as being against them. And that's one of the main issues of the story. Go back to this other ayat, Ikhwani, and we're going to jump forward, inshallah, to ayat number 24. Because it's one of those ayats of the ishkalat of the Quran. One of those ayats that people have a problem with understanding possibly if you don't hear the tafsir of it you can possibly understand it the wrong way ayat number 24 Allah Azza wa he mentioned وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَنْ رَأَى بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفْ عَنْهُ وَالسُوءَ الْفَحْشَاءَ إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ Allah mentioned when the story happened between Yusuf and the lady the lady desired Yusuf, and Yusuf was inclined towards the lady as well, if he did not see the burhan of his Lord. And verily we wanted to turn Yusuf away from evil and from lowliness, al-fahsha. For verily Yusuf, he was from our servants who were pure, and they were upright. So if you look at this ayah, it could appear that Yusuf had desires and ill intent and inclinations by the women. In the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, in the Torah that's with the Yahud right now, 
they talk bad about the prophets and the messengers. And one of the prophets and the messengers that they talk bad about is Yusuf. And they claim that Yusuf actually did a crime and that he really wanted to uh, be with the lady Hasha lillahi ta'ala. The ulama of al-Islam gave a different interpretation. Concerning Yusuf wanting to be with the lady, the scholars of al-Islam of the Tafsir, they said there was no one who was like Yusuf as it relates to this particular fitna. And that everything was thrown at him, but he didn't fall into the trap that was being set for him, although it was easy for him to do so. He was a young man, and usually if a person is young and he's from the Shabab, naturally he has his shahu and his desires. That's one of the characteristics of youngsters. So the Prophet told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, oh young people, you should fast. Do your best to fast. Those of you who can't get married, you should fast. Because it's a natural thing young people have to deal with. The older the individual gets, the less he has to deal with that, or the more control he should have in regards to his shahwa. Yusuf was young, he was unmarried. The man is married, and there's a fitna here or there. He can always take his shahwa to where it is halal to take him away from that particular issue. Yusuf didn't have that opportunity. In addition to that, Yusuf sallallahu alayhi he wasn't in his land. He was in the land of strangers. And it's a well-known fact that when people leave the place from where they come from and where people know them, that's where it's easy to do sins and to do ma'asi and to do things that he shouldn't do. Obviously, if a person is a place where he comes from, he's going to be more conscious about how he behaves in public's eye because the people know him. He goes to another place, the people don't know him. So therefore, he may lower his standards. Yusuf didn't do that, although he was in that condition. Everything was there to make a perfect storm. If Yusuf really wanted that, hey lady, he would have done it. But Allah Ta'ala protected him. As the ayah said, as you're going to see, inshallah. Yusuf was not free as such. He wasn't a total, absolute slave. He was more like a khadam in the house of that particular Aziz. He was respected, but nonetheless, he was purchased. So he was like a slave. And although he was a slave, he wasn't one of those slaves that was down in the dirt. He was a slave that was raised up a little bit. Nonetheless, the standards of the slaves are not like the standards of the people who are not slaves. Slaves will tend to do things in terms of their akhlaq and their behavior that people who are free don't do because there's a difference in the standards of both groups throughout history, throughout history, as it relates to behavior. Yusuf being with them, that wasn't from the issues that allowed him to make it okay to do that. He didn't do it. The lady was beautiful. The lady, she had position. The lady was in her house. The lady wanted him. Everything was there. Everything was there. Allah Azza wa said at the end of the ayat that كَذَلِكَ لِنَصِفَ عَنْهُ وَالسُّؤْلِ وَالْفَحْشَى We brought this issue to him so that we can turn him away from evil and from those desires of fahsha. So Allah established in the ayat that he turned Yusuf away from it. So if Allah turned Yusuf away from it, then Yusuf turned away from it. And it's not permissible for someone to come and say, but the ayah said she desired him and he, saw, he also desired her. There must be some interpretation for and he desired her. Why? If he in fact desired her in that type of a way, then he would have had to have made Toba as well. Because the prophets and the messengers don't make mistakes in the Quran except that they make Toba. That's consistent throughout the Quran. Not a single prophet or messenger in the Quran from the beginning to the end made a mistake except that he made Toba. Not one will you bring a story where he made a mistake and something happened except that he's going to make Toba. Not one. Yusuf as well. He never made Toba in the Quran about anything. So therefore, we have to understand the consistent pattern of the Quran is he didn't make mistake. He didn't make that particular mistake. The other thing said that he wanted her Lola and Ra'a Burhan Rabb. Lola and Ra'a Burhan Rabbi. He would have wanted her 
if he didn't see the sign of his Lord. So this is the majority interpretation of the scholars. They said that Yosef, when he saw that situation, like any human being, any normal man, if he was invited by a woman, if he was invited by a woman like this in this situation, any normal man, the issue would come to his mind. He would think about the possibility. But when Yusuf saw the burhan of his Lord, he said, no, I don't want that. What's the burhan of his Lord? The scholars gave different interpretations, most of which we don't accept them. Like Yusuf saw Jabril who came and told him, don't do it. There's no delil for that. Yusuf saw his father who came who told him, don't do it. There's no delil for that. Yusuf saw the shadow and image of the lady's wife, so he didn't do it. That's the burhan. All of those issues, there's no delil for it. Yusuf felt someone tapping him on his shoulder, and that's the burhan telling him, don't do it. All of those issues, we can't believe in them without delil. So what's the burhan? The taqwa of Allah. Yusuf knows that this is not something that the one who has a taqwa should be doing. This is not something that Allah is happy with. This is not something that Allah is pleased with. But instead it's the opposite. It's something that Allah is angry with. Something that can cause a lot of problems. So the point here is, no Muslim should believe that Yusuf, he had that thing other than the thought that naturally comes in the mind of any human being. And what was collected by the Bukhari and Muslim, Hadith al Qudsi. Allah Azza wa Jal said, If Benny Adam thinks about doing a good deed and he does that good deed, Allah will reward him 10 times up to 700 times. If he thinks about a good deed and he doesn't do the good deed, Allah will reward him one full good deed. But if he thinks about a bad deed and he doesn't do that bad deed, Allah will reward him for one bad deed. If he thinks about it and he doesn't do it, Allah will reward him as one good deed. But if he thought about it and he actually did it, then he'll be responsible according to what the thing is that he did. So the fact that Yusuf thought about this thing because it was presented to him, he's not blameworthy. Proof of that is this particular ayah or this hadith in addition to what was mentioned by the ulama of Al-Islam concerning the thoughts that come to our minds and whether or not a person acts upon him or not. We're going to stop here right now because the Adhan, inshallah, is like in uh, 10 minutes. So we'll give you five minutes if you guys have any questions, inshallah, ta'liqat concerning those three or four ayat. The canon the kum shaykh. You guys have anything? Fadli akhi, adui. Welcome back, adui. something out of his he wanted it to do it but he was prevented from doing the bad thing then he's still going to be held accountable for it because it's based upon his niya if he was prevented from doing the bad thing because of something else outside of his ability then as a result of that he's still going to be held responsible he wanted to go and do something crazy and the bad weather came because of the weather he wasn't able to do it that weather wasn't there like that if he didn't have that flat tire if that thing he wasn't delayed, he would have gone to do that thing. So it's based upon the person's intention. But if he left it from his own accord, with his near, was to leave it, then he'll get the reward in that case. But if he was prevented, no. Fadiyah. The whims, meaning like the hawa. So the hawa and between the wiswas of a shaitan. I would prefer to look that up as opposed to trying to answer that on my own. So let me look that up, inshallah, and I'll come with that with you next week, inshallah, azrajal. Okay, I'll write that down. Hey, can someone send that to me in a message? What's up? Whims, the fark bayna and hawa.
and with swas of his shaitan. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, inshallah, then we'll uh, stop here and we ask Allah Ta'ala for his tawfiq and success. And our success is only with Allah Azza wa Jal. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum.